Um, the five-week plan is as follows. You probably saw it on the invitation that you got through. First week, tonight, proof God's kingdom is near. Second week, purpose of the Armageddon war. Thirdly, the king and how he will govern. Fourth, extraordinary changes to the world. And five, how to prepare for the kingdom. So we hope it can be a really encouraging night for you, an encouraging series all the way through. I'm not talking about war, but it is an encouraging idea, I hope, because it leads to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I thought I'd briefly start with who we are and who I am. So we are the Christadelphians. We've been around for about 150 years by that particular name. We meet in churches like this and we call them ecclesias because that's the name we like to call ourselves. The name Christadelphian comes from the idea of being brothers in Christ. And you can see there in Colossians chapter 1, verse 2, Paul is writing to the believers at Colossae and he says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ. And you can see the the Greek equivalent for that one. Mix it up a bit, you've got your Christadelphian, Adelphoi and Christos. So that's that's kind of where we got, got the name from. Somebody had to come up with a name at some point, didn't they? And Matthew chapter 12, verse 50, we've got some support for why we might consider ourselves to be brothers or part of the family of Christ. Christ says, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. So it's a a very familial thing, it's a very nice thing to call yourself, and it's related to doing the will of God, following his commandments. In terms of the way we'll be approaching the seminars all the way through, we'll, we'll be referring to the Bible all the way. We believe the Bible is wholly inspired by God, and it's been demonstrably preserved all the way through the ages, kept in a a good form that we can use and trust and rely on. And we rely on both the Old and the New Testaments. We believe they work together and were seen beautifully together in Christ. And they help us to understand God's character and his purpose and how we can act to be part of the family of Christ that we mentioned before. In terms of who I am, my name's Tim Colliver, as I said. I work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. You probably saw the, the desktop background on my screen. So work in IT, a bit boring, a bit of a long job today, but we're going to get through tonight and talk about something a bit more interesting than IT. I thought I'd start with something almost mundane, use that word carefully, but it's something we all use quite commonly, the Lord's Prayer, or we we know of it. We start, I think Australia still starts Parliament with it, so it's a well-known thing. You can find it in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, or you can read it up there on the screen. And we'll just go through it. And there's just a few little things that give us a clue as to God's greater purpose behind this prayer. Christ is teaching his disciples how to pray. And he says, in this manner, therefore, pray. Gives them an idea. You can use this like a template, he says. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So our subject for tonight, the kingdom, pops up twice there. First in the beginning and in the last bit. The kingdom is related to God's power and his glory. But it's this idea of your kingdom come that's interesting to us tonight. When Christ was praying with these disciples, he was therefore implying the kingdom wasn't yet. It's not, he wasn't saying, we go to the kingdom, which might be up in heaven. He's saying, no, Father, your kingdom come. You are in heaven. Your kingdom come so that your will can be done on earth. So that gives us a really good clue that we're talking about a glorious kingdom of God on the earth, on this earth that we're talking about right now. And we've got something beautiful to look forward to. And in terms of tying that down a bit further, let's have a look at Acts chapter 1. I don't know if everyone's got a Bible tonight. You might have the sort of standard one that's been given out. I'm happy to give out page numbers if you've got that one with you. But in Acts chapter 1, we're talking about just after Christ's resurrection, when he's with his disciples again, just before he ascends up to his Father in heaven. And his disciples there ask him a really interesting question. And I'm aware that some of that font is a little bit small and I'm not going to be reading through it, so don't worry about that. We'll work on that for next week. Acts chapter 1, his disciples asked Jesus Christ a really important question. When they'd come together, they asked him and said, 
Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He's been talking to them for days and days after his resurrection, encouraging them in about what the Old Testament says about Moses and the prophets. And they ask him, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? So we've got this idea of the kingdom and Israel being tied together, a nation that existed in those days on the earth and was referred to as the kingdom of God. That was God's kingdom. Israel was God's kingdom. And in Christ's genealogy in Luke chapter 3, verse 23, we start to see all the pieces of God's great plan relating to this kingdom of God pulling together. So this is just a bit of an introduction and we'll sort of tie this through a bit further as we go. We get Christ himself began his ministry at 30 years of age and it goes through all of his parental line. It starts with Joseph as he was supposed to be the son of and continues through here until we get to an important man called David, descending from a man called Abraham, descending from Adam and lastly referred to as the son of God. So I'm not sure if you're fully aware of David, Abraham, Adam, almost everybody knows about. But these are really important people that God gave great promises to. Got great promises that showed his plan with the earth that we're talking about tonight in terms of showing that that plan is in effect. So Christ is the culmination of all of these plans, the culmination of great promises made to these three people in his history. So having a look at then at these three great promises, we'll need to turn them up. We can't look at them in a lot of detail tonight. But what I'm hoping to give you this evening is some of the cornerstones of God's plan in the Bible. What it's, what it's all about so that you've got a framework to fit things as we're working through these next few weeks with, with Jamie and myself. Back in Genesis chapter 3, we've had a pretty nasty circumstance. We've had Adam and Eve, a beautiful creation, but the wheels fallen off a bit. We know that the serpent tempted them and they followed through. They ate the fruit they weren't supposed to eat. They committed a sin and in Genesis chapter 3 God essentially condemns them to die. This is the consequences of, of what you've done but he gives them hope. He gives them hope way back in the beginning in the, the Garden of Eden. God gives them hope. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 he's talking to the snake here as he's just cursed him and said you're going to crawl on your belly for the rest of your days. In Genesis 3.15, he says, I'm going to put enmity or hatred between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, the people that think like you and the people that think like her. And then it swaps into a, a singular. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. I don't know if your Bible's like mine. It's capitalised the his there because it's important. It's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. This promise looks forward to him and says, what, what has happened in Eden, this sin, this sin that leads to death, he is a promise to overcome that. Christ is coming to overcome that. And there's lots of other ways we can look into that, but just the, just the fundamentals tonight, you can write those down if you, if you like. The next one we looked at was Abraham. So having got a promise to fix up the sin and death issue, now let's go to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. It's only a few, few pages over. Abraham was a faithful man in a time when there wasn't many around. God picks him up out of a, a pagan place where they worshipped everyone but God and finds him because he's looking for God. He's looking for something different to believe in, something real. And God picks him up and says to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, Abram, Abram and Abraham are the same person. It was a name change a bit later on. He says, get out of your country, leave your family and your father's house, go to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you and in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now there we've got Abraham and we find out about his wife Sarah as well. They're very old and they've got no children but God promises them numerous descendants. He promises him to be a great name, someone who's going to have be known throughout the world. He gives him a personal blessing and a blessing for all the families of the world. Now we've cheated, we've already seen the descendants of the, 
the ancestors, sorry, of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is that blessing for all the families of the world. He is what we have opportunity at salvation through. So there was Abraham's blessing to come. And in Genesis chapter 13, just a little bit further, we get some, another blessing given to Abraham. Genesis chapter 13, verse 14. God says to Abraham, after he'd had a bit of difficulty with Lot and they'd split up, another part of Abraham's family, lift up your eyes now, look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward and westward. Now where is he? They're, they're in the land of Canaan, near the, near the river Jordan. Look from where you are, northward, southward, eastward and westward, all the land you see I will give to you and your descendants forever. This is the beginning of God's promise about his kingdom, a kingdom on the earth. But unfortunately, Abraham died living in a tent. He had, to, he had to buy a plot of land to bury his wife in. God didn't fulfill this promise to Abraham during Abraham's lifetime. Abraham has to wait for this promise until we all can be part of it as well to, in, in, the kingdom, in the kingdom of God. And one more cornerstone will go to David the king. Now you may know David's son, David's son Solomon, but David the king was a man after God's own heart. God loved this man David and worked, a, worked in the kingdom of Israel significantly with him. So we're jumping across hundreds of years now to David who was the second king of Israel after Abraham had, had a promised son Isaac. God blessed him and gave him a family in their old age many descendants through until we get to the tribes in Israel, the land of Israel that we know today, and a King David sitting on the throne. Now, 2nd of Samuel, chapter 7, we get God's promise to David, and it builds on these promises that we've had before. That promise back in Eden, there's a, there's a solution for sin and death. That promise to Abraham, you're going to be a blessing and you're going to have ownership of this land. God, in 2 Samuel 7, promises David something about a king. So let's read through there from verses 12 through 16. God says to David, When your days are fulfilled, and you rest with your fathers, so after you're dead, I will set up from your seed after you, your descendants. He will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, immediately there, you're probably thinking, well, that sounds like Solomon. Solomon's your son. Solomon's going to set up on the kingdom. But we keep going in verse 13. He's going to build a house for my name. Solomon built a beautiful temple for God. It was, it was famous throughout the world. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. He is the clash. Solomon, Solomon died after 40 years on the throne. He didn't, this kingdom did not last forever. Verse 14, I will be his father Perhaps that's a bit figurative for Solomon, but it's literal for Jesus Christ. He shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, who was the king before David, whom I removed before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. That's interesting. After you're dead, David, I'm going to establish your kingdom forever forever before you, in front of you, where you can see it. David has to be resurrected too. David has to be alive on the earth to see this kingdom that's coming with King Lord Jesus Christ reigning over it. Your throne shall be established forever. So this was the vision that God gave to David through Nathan the prophet, to give him encouragement that through his line, the Lord Jesus Christ was going to come and he would reign on David's throne forever. So those, is, those are some cornerstones, really, to understanding the plan and purpose of God with the earth, what he's, what he's intending to do with it. He started off in the beginning creating man and woman, hoping that they would be a beautiful creation that could serve and worship him, but sin threw a spanner in the works. Sin and death left us where we are today. We're in a bit of trouble. But God, Jesus Christ is the solution. It came through Abraham. It came through David. And we're looking for the fulfillment of all these three promises to have eternal life in his kingdom, that kingdom being based in the land of Israel that was promised to Abraham and the king sitting on King David's throne 
that was promised to faithful King David. So to jump over now to start looking at probably more to do with, with our times. Now we've got a little bit of a foundation. Let's have a look at Matthew chapter 24. And here we've got a prophecy from the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a couple of pictures down the bottom there. I thought they might inspire a little bit. It's sort of designed to be a picture of Jesus Christ looking out over the over Jerusalem, basically, the glory of Jerusalem as it was in those days. Because we start in Matthew 24. Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came up to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Now, this was Herod's temple. Solomon's temple had been crushed. Herod rebuilt it, beautiful, more beautiful than ever. And the disciples loved it. All of the Israeli Jews loved this temple. It was glorious. It would have glistened in the evening sun if you were looking out in that sort of view. And the disciples said, oh, Jesus, look at this beautiful temple, thinking they were doing the right thing. And Jesus says to them in verse 2, don't you see, not one stone shall be left here upon another. The thing's going to be raised to the ground. Jerusalem is going to be raised to the ground. And you've got an artist's impression in that second picture over there. AD 70, about 40 years later, Christ had prophesied the complete destruction of Jerusalem and it was very complete and utter. So I thought we'd have a bit of a look through this prophecy because there are two important aspects to it. If you look at the, the beginning of it, you get a prophecy to help those who were living in Jerusalem at the time know when this Roman army was going to come and give them an opportunity to get out, to save their lives, so that the faithful would be saved. But if you keep going from verse 29 onwards, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heaven, and, all, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He's jumped straight from giving a prophecy about the coming Roman destruction of AD 70 into, I'm coming back. I'm coming back to the earth. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect, the, the people that are looking for him in the earth, from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And he talks about a, a fig tree because we, he knows that people at that time understood how trees worked. You got flowers, you got blossoms, then you got fruit. There was a, a seasonal pattern to it. He said, if you look for the, that, that, that fig tree, you know what's going to happen. You know it will produce fruit. At the same time, he says, look for the signs for my return and you'll know that I'm coming back. But in verse 36, we've got a bit of a challenge. Of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father knows only. So he's saying you're not going to know what day it is. The angels in heaven don't know what day it is. Only God knows, and it's part of God's plan to make it happen. And if we jump ahead to verse 44, therefore also be ready, the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So there's a, bit of, there's a bit of a challenge in terms of tonight's topic, isn't it? Tonight's topic is how do we know the kingdom of God is near? Christ and God says to us, you won't, you're not exactly going to see it coming. It's going to take you by surprise a little bit. But there are signs you can look forward to, and that's what we're going to go through tonight. So let's, let's go back and, then, and keep going through verse 37 onwards. He talks about the days of, the, of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. This is a sign. If we know what the days of Noah looked like, then we'll know what the days of the Son of Man's return will look like. And he gives us a bit of detail in verse 38. As in the days before the flood, way back in Genesis, we'll find the story of Noah, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So there's a parable story in there. Don't, don't let it be like that for you, for those people that were around when Noah was building his ark. If you see someone building an ark, get on board. It's a good time. And he says, there will be two men in the field, one will be taken and the other left. 
This is how dramatic it is in terms of Christ's return. One, one's taken and one's left behind because that other person perhaps wasn't looking like the fig tree. He wasn't looking for the fruit or the signs. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one taken and the other left. Keep watch, therefore. You don't know what hour the Lord is coming. And he says, well, why doesn't, why doesn't he give us an exact time? He says, know this. If, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allow, allowed his house to be broken into. He would have stayed up just on that night, got ready just at that moment, and said, hey, thief, I'm ready for you. But we need to be ready all the time so that the thief doesn't come through and catch us unawares. So let's try and unpack some of these ideas that we can find in there. I mean, we started off with the, the sun, moon, and stars in, in verse 29. And that sounds somewhat dramatic, the sun, moon, and stars collapsing. It sounds like the end of the world. And we're certainly not talking about that. Ezekiel chapter 32, verses 7 and 8, and Isaiah 13, verses 1 and verse 10, give us some context for these ideas to say, this has been prophesied before, and it hasn't happened before. The sun, moon, and stars aren't collapsing into the earth. These are things that talk about political movements. It's a way of saying the po politics of the world, the way the world is, the kings and queens and everyone that's in power, they're in trouble. They're the ones that are coming down to the ground. So it's not a, certainly not a literal destruction of the, the heavenly bodies. Although we do have Matthew 27, verse 45. God has the power to make a lot of these things happen. At Christ's death, there was three hours of darkness in the afternoon between 3pm 3, 3 and 6pm. It was definitely a miraculous event. God has the power to do these things, but when he's talking about the coming of the Son of Man and the sun will be darkened, the moon not giving its light, he's talking about a great political upheaval. What about the days of Noah? Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 tells us a little bit more detail about what was going on in the world. and We may have heard of the flood, the, the flood that we believe was a universal flood and covered the whole earth. It was, caused great destruction of life. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 tells us why God did this. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So all, everything man was thinking about was evil. This was only a few generations after Adam and Eve had had that intimate relationship with God. They'd been able to talk to him and talk to his angels. And now, a few generations later, it, everyone's thinking evil thoughts. And just that comparison back to verse 38 of Matthew 24. As in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. So Christ is saying that this is a symbol of the time just before his return. The way that people were thinking, the way that people were acting, that's what the world will be like just before he returns. And Perhaps I'll leave it to your imagination in terms of how much evil is going on in the world in terms of people's thoughts. But perhaps in verse 38 there, the idea is not so much that eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage is wrong, but if, if that's all you're doing instead of thinking about God, then that's where we get a bit of a problem. Let's change tack a little bit now and, and talk about Israel. We've mentioned the kingdom of Israel. David reigned over the kingdom of Israel. Christ was prophesied in that promise to David to reign on David's throne forever. And the disciples talked about, Lord, will you at, time, at this time restore the kingdom of God to Israel? Now, if we go back just 100 years, Israel didn't exist. Now, why didn't Israel exist? Because AD 70 was about the end of it. AD 70, that prophecy that God Christ gave in Matthew 24, saw the end of Israel as we know it. It was 1,900 years later before we started to see anything that looked like Israel, that started to look like the restoration. But that's important for us tonight when we're talking about those signs that we can see, the idea of the fig tree, this, the signs that Christ is coming soon. So in AD 70, God was utterly displeased with this people. They'd crucified his son, they'd completely turned away. If, you, if, you weren't, if you're there in the nation of Israel at that time and you wouldn't even listen to the son of God who was walking around doing great miracles, there's a lot wrong. 
So there was great destruction. And, and God had used that destruction before. Ezekiel chapter 21 records one of those prophecies. So we'll have a look through at that one. So Ezekiel chapter 21 and verse 26. God here in Ezekiel 21 is going to use the kingdom of Babylon to destroy Israel for their wickedness at that time. And in verse 26, thus says the Lord God, remove the turban, take off the crown, nothing shall remain. Exalt the humble and humble the exalted. Overthrown, overthrown, I will make it no overthrown. It shall be no longer until he comes... I don't know if your Bible's capitalized like mine is, capital H for he comes, whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Now, take off the crown. This was the last crown ever worn by a kingdom of Israel or Judah. This was, that crown was never worn again. There was never another king uh, since this time. And this is talking about, about 600 BC, when Babylon came through under Nebuchadnezzar and wiped out the kingdom of Israel and made it part of his state. So there was ne has never ever been a king of Israel since that time, but Christ is the one. He will come, and it will be his right to wear it in fulfilment of that prophecy given to David. And in Zechariah, we'll see another prophecy that talks about Jerusalem as rest being restored as well. So Zechariah, right towards the, the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 8. And Zechariah, again, is during, a, during this time of, of exile for Israel. Israel is kicked out of their land. They're living in foreign country. And this prophet Zechariah is giving them hope, or he's been given hope by God to share with them. Zechariah chapter 8, and we'll start from verses 7 to 8. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. They're everywhere. I will bring them back. They shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Now, certainly the last part of that probably isn't quite true of the, the people of Israel today. Many of them are atheists. It's a, it's a secular country by, by all rights. There's more still to come in, in fulfillment of that prophecy. But it's important because it makes reference to Israel and Jerusalem in particular. And just before we talk about the map, we'll go on to verses 20, and 20, 20 through 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, People shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us continue to go and pray before the Lord. Seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will go also. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. So that's where God tells us about his kingdom centred in Jerusalem. It's not just a prophecy of restoration, Israel getting Jerusalem back. It's a prophecy about God's kingdom and all nations coming to pray there. So in terms of these maps that we've got in front of us, remember about BC 600, Nebuchadnezzar wipes Israel off the map. There's never a king since. AD 70, the Roman army wipes Israel off forever. Israel ceases to appear as a nation. But in these prophecies, God says, I'm going to bring them back. And it took 1,900 years for God to put that plan into effect to achieve it. 1897, that picture on the far left, there is no Israel. It was called Palestine. 1946, you probably think of a number of dates that have occurred between those two times, pretty significant events in the world, two world wars and a lot of destruction and heartache. 1946, few little green spots there to show Israeli settlements. They're starting to return to the land. 1947 and 1948. 1948 was when the, state, the nation of Israel was declared by the United Nations. Israel existed again, but they didn't have Jerusalem. 1967, this was a six-day war. Then they captured Jerusalem again. Very dramatic times up against quite significant odds. But if you're looking at your Bible prophecy, you'd be going, it's kind of likely they're going to end up with this. And they did. They've got Jerusalem now. They have Israel. 
And you can see the issues the Palestinians have right now. There's not much yellow left on that map in the present day. There's a lot of conflict in that place. And we certainly don't stand here tonight pretending that the Israeli people are nice people or good people. They are God's people, but they're a secular nation doing their own thing. But God has a great plan with them, and he intends to make them his people, as we saw in that, those earlier verses in Zechariah. So after nearly 2,000 years of waiting for this fruit to appear on the tree, waiting to see these prophecies about the nation of Israel come back and be fulfilled, we're almost there. Israel's back in the land. Jerusalem is part of their, their nation. And there's some more prophecies to come because they're due for another attack, due to have it all go a bit wrong. Have a look in Ezekiel chapter 38. Now, I really don't want to steal Jamie's thunder. He's going to go through the start of this in much more detail next week. So we're just going to introduce the idea so you've got a plan of what's, what's happening when we can talk next week. Ezekiel chapter 38, it's got a little title over here, Gog and Allies Attack Israel. Now, I'll leave it to, to Jamie to have the fun conversation. Gog is a confederation led by Russia. And you can see, set your in verse 2, Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh. The prince of, of Russia, essentially there. We've got a Russian-led aggressor here coming with a, a named coalition. There's a number of names given of ancient, ancient states, ancient countries, and we have their modern equivalents today that we can still see. Some of them aligned to Russia already, some of them still to come, and that's where we're looking at for those signs. And they're coming against Israel, Israel that's dwelling in peace. Verse 11, you'll say, I'll go up to the land of unwalled villages. I'll go to a peaceful people. They dwell safely without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Israel think they're doing okay. And this Russian-led aggressor comes down to make a spoil. So in verse 2, we have the who. In verse 8, we have the where. After many days, in the latter days, you'll come into the land of those brought back from the sword, gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel. So this prophecy assumes those earlier ones have already taken place. They've already been fulfilled. Israel's been gathered back into their land, ready for this prophecy to begin. And we have the why in verse 13. Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, the sort of good guys of the picture, say to them, have you come to take a plunder? Have you come to spoil the land? To take booty and carry away silver and gold, livestock and goods, to take a great plunder. Why are you coming to attack Israel? Obviously, there's something in it for this nation who wants to, to come down and attack. But there's so much going on around this time. All these other latter-day prophecies start to come into effect right around this time. Daniel chapter 11 tells us about the king of the south and the king of the north. King of the north, where is Russia in relation to Israel? North, straight up. Daniel chapter 11, we'll pick it up right towards the end in verse 40. At the time of the end, the time right before Jesus Christ returns to the earth, the king of the south shall attack him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them and pass through. He's coming down on a rampage down through the Middle East. He shall enter the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown. Some of them are going to escape. He's stretching out his hand against the countries. The land of Egypt won't escape. He's coming all the way through down towards Egypt. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, over the precious things of Egypt. The Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. This is a nasty, nasty war. And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, Yet, God says, he will come to his end and no one will help him. And Daniel chapter 12 starts off with the hope. Daniel 12 verse 1, At that time Michael shall stand up, a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Since this nation of Israel has been there, there will never have been a time of trouble such as this. 
and at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who's written in the book. And in verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, people who are dead, long dead. You can probably think of a couple of names that we've mentioned tonight. Adam, Abraham, David, people who've long since died shall awake, some of them to everlasting life. Certainly we know those faithful ones will be. Some to shame and everlasting contempt. There is definitely a judgment that happens after the resurrection to find out who will be given eternal life. But those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So righteousness there is the key. Being right like God in, in terms of getting eternal life. So there's some great hope bound up at this time. So just to, to briefly recap, Israel back in the land, Jerusalem back as part of Israel, a Russian-led aggressor coming down, dependent on this prophecy being fulfilled, attacking Israel in the land of Israel. And at that time is when God intervenes to start the beginning of Christ's return. There's also a couple more prophecies we'll quickly look at to give some more detail about what's going on at this time because this is about where Bible prophecy really starts to, to hit the road. Every prophet gets a little bit excited and wants to write about the time of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14 verses 1 to 4. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming and your spoil will be divided in your midst. We're talking about the war here, what's going on with the, that aggressor taking up the goods. I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. We're getting some detail now about what this aggressor is actually doing. It's, it's unfortunately serious destruction, and it's a world war. Everyone's involved in this. But then, in verse 3, the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Now we can take it right back to, we're talking about Acts chapter 1, a bit earlier, about uh, Christ responding to his disciples when they said, will you restore the kingdom of God to Israel? Acts chapter 1, just a few verses on, is where Christ ascends up to heaven. From the Mount of Olives, he goes up, and the angels say to his disciples standing there, this same Jesus that you've seen going up into heaven is coming back the same way. He will so come in like manner. And here, here is the fulfillment of that, the, the prophecy that fulfills it. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Christ is returning. And Joel chapter 3 gives us a little bit more detail about that one. Joel chapter 3 tells us, Behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, it's related to those prophecies of Israel coming back to the land. Then I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they scattered among the nations. And if you keep reading all the way, all the way through, there's, there's more detail there about, in verse 9, proclaim this among the nations, prepare for war. Everyone's going to be warlike. Assemble, come together. Come to the valley of Judge Jehoshaphat, in verse 12. There I will sit and judge all the surrounding nations. Verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The day of Yahweh is near in the valley of decision. And just coming back, the sun and the moon will grow dark. The stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. Jerusalem has a role to play in the kingdom of God and God is talking about a great war in this valley of Jehoshaphat. Now we're talking about Armageddon in the coming weeks. I thought we'd quickly introduce that idea in Revelation chapter 16 because that's tied into this valley of Jehoshaphat. Revelation chapter 16, and from verses 12 to 16 there. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Its water was dried up, 
so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. This is a judgment on one of the nations associated with the river Euphrates, a judgment on Turkey. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. There's some very symbolic language in the book of Revelation. Don't have time tonight to do that justice. Out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of demons performing signs which achieve the following. They go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. That same concept from Matthew 24. Blessed is he who watches, keeps an eye on the fig tree, the signs of the fig tree, and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together in the place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now the meaning of that idea of the word Armageddon is judgment. People being gathered together for judgment. And we've got gathered together into Armageddon, gathered together to the valley of Jehoshaphat, a place where God had redeemed his people before, where he'd saved them in an earlier promise in Second Chronicles chapter 20 on the screen there. And culminating in all of these things then, we now have the kingdom of God forever centred in Israel. It's a very dramatic series of events that we've got to look forward to, if I can use that term, to look forward to coming on the earth. But it's a time of trouble that such as never was. It's not going to be an easy time for anybody to look forward to. Tim, do you think we're living in verse 14? That's the time frame that we're in at the moment. Verse 14 of Joel? 16, verse 14. Definitely in terms of the longer... Yeah, it's, it's a long process, but definitely th this is the time of now when all these nations are being pivoted, if you will. God's working with them. His angels are out there making sure the world leaders are following his plan. There's something I wanted to mention a little bit earlier in terms of, well, we've gone through prophecy a few times, and it's perhaps a funny idea to talk about prophecy. We generally talk about prophecy in the idea of, you know, foretelling the future. This is what the future is going to look like. God does it a little bit differently. He says, this is what I'm going to make the future be. That's, that's God's idea of prophecy. I'm working to achieve this. This is what I'm going to achieve because I'm God. It's not just something that'll happen. Now really, when it comes to today's world, there's, there's not, that much, not that much good news. When we think about the on the world, we've got massive poverty. Nearly half the world's population more than 3 billion people live on less than $2.50 a day. And then there's an extreme $1.3 billion, $1 billion people living on less than $1.25 a day. This world has some very, very, very systemic issues. And we've got a great reason then to look forward to the Kingdom of God. To look forward to Christ's return when some of this will be overcome. And Jamie and I look forward to sharing the, the hope that's shared in the Bible about the glories of these kingdoms and how it can overcome some of these ideas. What about environmental damage? One third of arable land has been lost in the last 40 years because we build over the top of it, crush it, destroy it, overwork it. Food shortages are getting more and more common. Food shortages cause war, famine, death and destruction. We've got climate change. We can, we can see it generally happening life-threatening weather and rising sea levels affecting some of those poor, smaller nations. And then we get to politics and war. Turns out if you're having a bit of a hard time in your country and you don't have any oil, we don't care. We, we, we won't send in the troops. We only send in the troops when it's something useful for us. Trump says, I'm going to put America first. Too bad about the rest of you. Everyone's in currency and trade wars and the people who suffer of a third world who haven't got any resources to fall back on. There's about 40 to 50 million refugees around the world displaced from war, poverty and oppression. And you've got to ask, when it comes to the hope of the Bible, is there an alternative? Is there a, a human solution that we could look forward to instead? Trump is unfortunately everything that his people wanted and it's probably going to result in more suffering for them. When, when humans get a chance to vote, Trump is the result. I don't think we're very good at voting for nice kings. 
which is why the Lord Jesus Christ will be the one you don't vote for, but hopefully hope for. Climate change hurts the, hurts the economy, so it gets watered down and never delivered. There's massive inequality. You buy your votes, you buy your governments, and it's, all the money's floating up to the top. When it comes to war, there's no money left to fight anything unless it, you've got a personal stake in it, unless it's going to be, do something for you. So great genocide goes on because it doesn't cross our news. Poverty and malnutrition is rife. In the first world, we, we waste a lot of food. We know we do, we all do it. And we cut our aid budgets because we're worried about our pockets. And in the last one, medicine can't cure death. We have so many advances in medicine, but we still face the same problem that Adam and Eve faced when they sinned that first time. They started to die, and we're all going to die if Jesus Christ doesn't return and commence that judgment process. And some, something somebody asked me, it was only a, a week ago, I said, well, why has it taken so long? It was a, it was a rhetorical question. You know, why, why has it taken so long for God to send, plan to send Christ back to the earth? And there's, there's two ways of looking at that. One is, that was his plan and that's what he wanted to do. He was waiting for, you know, you and I here tonight, because I've only been baptised and born in the last 40 years. Maybe he was waiting for me and you. Or maybe he was just waiting for, to give us 6,000 years to prove, yep, yeah, we really, really, really couldn't fix this ourselves. We had a really good go, and we just got worse. So to, to sum up, and we're pretty well out of time tonight, Israel is returned to their land. This is, that's a prophecy that took 2,000 years to come to pass. People were looking in their Bibles and going, where's Israel? Where's Israel? Where's Israel? And we've, we've seen it in some of our lifetimes. I won't mention names. Russia is, is nearby and powerful. Who are they fighting at the moment? Why, why are they involved in the Middle East? Syria. Not too far to the north. And they're powerful and they're angry and they're not particularly well liked by Israel. They're happy to vote against them. The times of Noah are unfortunately here again. We know what people out, the, out there think. We know it's all about sex, drugs and rock and roll. No one's got much time for God anymore. Certainly the times of Noah are here. The world is on edge and we don't have another solution. So it comes down to some fairly simple questions if I want to pose it to you this way. So the first one, rhetorical of course, if we all just evolved over millions of years after a big bang that started for no reason, what realistic hope do we have that humanity can overcome its selfishness and greed to find a solution for our children? I don't have a lot. There's not, not much to it. But if you work through those four points below, can you believe in a God? Can you look around you and think, God did this? Do you believe that he created a world to be inhabited, to be gloriously inhabited and filled with people who love him? Do you think he created humans with a purpose and gave us a brain that far surpasses all of the other animals so that we could have intellect to find him and appreciate him? And a God who loved us so much that he sent his only son to die and enable that salvation, even when we were doing the wrong thing. So it's a fairly simple process to go sort of yes, no, yes, no, as you're going through. If you get four yeses in the bottom, there's a lot, of, a lot more hope than perhaps that uh, first bullet point. And this kingdom will be glorious. There's a couple of verses just up there on the screen to give you an inkling to look forward to, just so I don't steal any more of Jamie's thunder. Numbers chapter 14, Moses writes, on, on behalf of God, as truly as I live, as truly as God lives, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of God. This is the intent behind the kingdom of God. On the earth, full of God's glory. What, we, what was started off in the, the Garden of Eden, all made very good, all fell apart with sin, God intends to recover. As I live, I've got a plan to fix this. And Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, we talked about eternal life before. What does that look like? What does eternal life feel like? Those who wait on the Lord, those who intend to be like him, they shall renew their strength. He will give them eternal life. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not be weary, walk and not faint. Eternal life is that idea of boundless energy. And the last slide for tonight, what we're planning to cover off next week and in those future weeks in just a little bit more detail, 
the purpose of the Armageddon War, so that idea from Revelation, the, the war that's coming towards the land of Israel, more detail on who is, who is involved and why it's happening, going into those amazingly detailed prophecies. Then continuing on to the king and how he will govern, looking more into the character of Christ and what, the, what God's kingdom promises to us, the detail of how beautiful this will be and how it will solve a lot of those issues that we, we mentioned a bit before. Then continuing to talk about the extraordinary changes to the world, environmental and societal changes, back to the way God intended. E economic and political upheaval, though, these things won't happen overnight. They certainly won't look like they do today. And in the last night that we've got together, unless we've got lots and lots of questions, of course, what can we do today to become part of God's family? BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any Ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own Ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's milestone snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.